Okay, good morning, gentlemen. You have uh, Professor Shoemaker and Professor Vermelin is in the upper uh, left-hand part of your screen there. We're going to go over today uh, the uh, assignment for April the 2nd in creation of this video. And part of that assignment is due on Monday by 9 p.m. on Monday. And you'll see those instructions in D2L is their creation of a underground major equipment project. This is going to be similar to the uh, generation to meter project where you have to list out the equipment that's being used and what its purpose is. So we're going to start out here. I'm going to give the uh, major equipment in order, give you a picture of it, and uh, as obviously you'll see more instructions in D2L of you know, either PowerPoint or Google Slides and where to mail it to. So first on the uh, screen I have here, what they call an underground dip pole. And this will be your first slide. Now, a dip pole is a transition. And you'll see here from overhead to underground. You'll see the overhead primary is coming here. Zoom this in a little bit. Overhead primary is coming into the uh, dead end then going down to what they call a terminator here and that then down underground do these conduits to wherever they need to go similar to the college uh, you will see overhead that it encompasses around all of the college and at certain points around the college you'll see where the primary goes underground and into the college grounds so this is dipping overhead to underground you'll see in some cases at the substation that we had uh, that we toured out there that the wires when they underground primary wires when they go out of the substation they come underground and go out to highway 501 and then go overhead that is called a riser so if I have my feed direction coming from the substation over here to the pole and then out overhead that is rising and called a riser pole if I have underground that is fed from the overhead and it goes underground to a transformer or wherever it needs to go. That is called a dip. Anything you wish to add there, Robbie? I know you can't see this, but uh, that's the explanation. Okay. Next will be what they call a dead front switch gear or a pad mounted switch gear. And we had talked previously in class, or I think you can remember back where the book actually says that switch gear are all switches, and we uh, explained that that really isn't true. This is an actual switch gear. So, after the dip pole, you can have either feeder coming down the dip pole, or you can have tap coming down the dip pole. A feeder will come into what they call a switch gear and it has compartments. Now you can have a four compartment switch gear or a six compartment switch gear. Those are the most typical ones you'll see out there in the world. And the compartments are designated by numbers. So in this example that I have right here, this is a six compartment switch gear. One, two, three, and on the opposite side, one, two, three, that are not visible because it's turned this direction. If you look at your underground distribution standards manual, which will be attached to the D2L assignment, and find the switch gear in there, you will notice that it is numbered. 642 is what I'm going to use for the example. So 6 designates total compartments 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on the back side. The 4 is the amount of feeder switch locations. Now remember a feeder switch is a dead blade disconnect switch and the two will designate taps. So if you see in the underground distribution standards manual a 642 switch gear that designates six total, four feeder compartments, and two tap compartments. And they can be made in any kind of fashion that you need. You can have a 624 six total, two feeder, and four tap. If you have a four compartment switch gear, you can have a four, two, two. Four feeder, I mean, excuse me, four total, two feeder, two tap. 
its purpose right here is to obviously switch feeders around if you need to switch the uh, feed of uh, different feeder lines and then have taps coming out of them to be able to go onto different equipment. There is no transformation going on here. It's just a junction point for feeders and for taps. Robbie, anything you wish to add there? Thank you very much. Our next piece of equipment, let me get this a little bit better here. Okay. These two pieces of equipment serve the same function. This one on the right hand side is what they call a three phase enclosure primary, and this is a single phase enclosure primary. We'll talk about the three phase enclosure primary first. One. Both in the three phase and the single phase enclosure, there is no transformation. You'll hear sometimes they're also called three phase and single phase junctions, and that's exactly what their purpose is. I'm able in the three phase enclosure to install A, B, and C phases, and you'll notice here that I'm going in different module locations. These four bushings right here each are all banded together behind and are called a module. So if I install A here in position 1, position 2 will be A, position 3 will be A, position 4 will be A. I install B here, B will be here, B will be here, and B will be here. And if I install C here, C. C, C, C. We follow the same rules as we do in the industry. A, B, C, left to right. And our feed in, as far as the phase is concerned, is always in the left. So I'm coming with my, from my switch gear, from my tap compartment. I'm going to come into position A. And then if I need to go different directions with more phases of primary, this goes down one street, this goes down one street, this goes down another street and I can do that with all three phases so a encompassing explanation right here would be a three phase enclosure or junction is a place to be able to come in with any or all of the three phases and be able to junction out to different locations Robbie anything you would wish to add on the three phase enclosure Uh, they are not labeled. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. The question was, in case you, how are these labeled? Well, there's no labeling on them. There's no number one, two, three, four here, and there's no A, B, or C. Not when you first get the three-phase enclosure. That is a rule of the industry. A always goes on the left, B in the middle, C on the right, and that's where you're going to do inside meter bases that's what you're going to do inside three phase enclosures that's what you're going to do inside transformers when we get to the three phase transformer also uh, these are not numbered one two three four as far as in your construction process oops as far as your construction process you will know by the conduits that you installed and the wire that you pulled uh, i pulled wire from the switch gear to this point for a and b and c phases they all go on position one. Okay. Uh, the map says, or the ticket work request says, work order says, well, I need to take all of uh, position two A and go down Oak Street, which is this direction. So that A, that B, and that C would go in condo. It's down Oak Street. And this needs to go down Pine Street. This is position three. A down Pine. B down pine and C down pine and so on and so forth. Does that help in just the verbal explanation? I know you can't see what's going on here, but I'm mousing over this stuff at the same time I'm doing it. Okay. All right, let's move over to the single phase enclosure. Just as the name implies, I'm able to put three phases in here. I'm only able to use one individual phase in here, either one of A, one of B, or one of C. I cannot put multiple phases inside this one. This one came, you see the back plate is here, but it doesn't have the module on it. 
you can put any type of module that you want to in here. So let's do that. We'll just take a look right here. Picture this module being mounted in here. Follows the same rules. I can come in with one A and out with an A, out with an A, and out with an A. You'll notice I've just used one single phase, but I can junction it in three different directions, not including the inbound. Inbound is one direction, outbound one, outbound two, outbound three, all of the same phase. Anything you wish to add there, Mr. Robbie? All right, thank you very much. All right, next on our list is a three-phase transformer. You'll notice the size here, 2,500 kVA, so it's a big boy. Looking inside the transformer, and you can use this as a look back. We just came out of the three-phase uh, excuse me, three-phase enclosure with three phases A, B, and C, and we're going into the college campus. So the rule to follow right here would be, and we're going to follow the same rule again, left to right, A, B, and C. Robbie, I'm mousing over the bushings right here. All right. And it does have the capability of going outbound again. So this is actually acting like a little junction right here, plus transformation in one spot. What has to happen here is if you put A on this bushing, it has to match the bushing that's on the opposite side of it. So if A is here, the outbound A has to be here. B is here, the outbound B has to be here. C is here, outbound C has to be here. All right. Another uh, property of this transformer, and Robbie uh, made me aware of this, is it is fused. One, two, three three fuses, one for each face. These are called bayonet fuses. And they look similar to a bayonet that goes at the end of a gun. Not too much like one, but it is it is like a bayonet. And it's the fuse portion for the transformer core, the transformer windings itself. So if there's a fault inside the transformer case or on the secondary lines going out, somebody digs into them or they short out, these fuses will blow. Simply take your shotgun, open this up, and we'll see some videos later on on how to replace a bayonet fuse. Pull the fuse out, replace it, put the fuse back in, and you re restore power to the secondary. If that happens, just remember what's going on here is not affected. You want to maintain your feed in and feed out because there might be tr more transformers down the line here. It only separates the core windings of the transformer. Another pop property of three-phase transformers, excuse me, <coughs> is that you'll see on the primary side and the secondary side, if A is in this position right here and you designate that A, go to the secondary side, I can identify neutral zoom a little bit here I can identify the neutral by the bond that goes to the tank of the transformer see these copper wires they are mounted directly onto the tank of the transformer so these each designate the three phases that are coming out of the secondary side A B C left to right A is installed on this one so if that is the case, if I have a failure of the primary or a blown fuse on A down the line, I will have no voltage from the neutral to this A bushing. You don't even need to check the primary if you're at the transformer. If I have no voltage from A to neutral, A phase primary is not good. That's also including the A bayonet fuse. So if the A is the only bayonet fuse blown, I will not have A voltage to ground. Same as B. B primary has failed, or I have a B blown bayonet fuse. Neutral, B. I will not have voltage from B to neutral, and so on for C.
Anything you wish to add? Very much. Single phase parent bound transformer. Well, we just moved away from A, excuse me, moved away from three phase, and now, just like the three phase enclosure and single phase enclosure, I'm able to put three phase in the three phase enclosure. Uh, excuse me, three phases in that one. In the single phase, I'm only able to put one. Same case here. I'm only able to come in with one phase and out with the same phase. You can use any one of the three phases, but only one can be used. I can go in here with A phase, B phase, or C phase, but only one of those. Inbound of a transformer is always on H1A. Inbound wire comes in. Outbound primary wire goes out, goes down to the next transformer in line. For safety's sake, and if you need to know this out there in the world, which you will do, for safety's sake, do not trust that the original installer put the inbound on A or the outbound on B. If you have to do switching with a shotgun stick and remove, your assumption will be a good installer put this elbow on A, inbound elbow on A, or inbound wire on A. I pull it off. I should have an energized elbow in my shotgun stick. That might not be the case. So I just want to give that safety warning right there. You will not know until you pull the conductor off which one is the inbound and which one is the outbound. But the rule is for construction. Inbound on A, outbound on B. Please do be safe. Again, we do have another bayonet fuse. Acts the same as it did in the three-phase transformer. It separates the core transformer windings from the primary conductor. Think of this as inbound here, outbound here. Inside the transformer, there's just a bar that goes between here and here and off that bar taps to the fuse and the fuse goes into the windings. If I have a secondary fault on my secondary lines or an internal fault in the transformer that fuse is going to blow. Same thing as before remove the fuse of the shotgun stick replace it reinstall it and we'll have a video showing you how to do that later. This is just for the equipment side. On our transformer secondary side, we can identify neutral very quickly. It is the lug right here that's bonded to the case of the transformer, so that is neutral. We'll, for an example here, say this is a 120, 240 volt transformer. On X1, if we take a voltmeter with one lead and go to X2, we should have 120 volts. X3 to X2, 120 volts and I take our leads from our voltmeter and go from X1 to X3, 240 volts. Anything else that I missed there, Professor Vermelin? No, I did not. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Vermelin said, did you get the switch at the top right? There's two methods to de-energize the secondary of this transformer. In this case, some of them come built a little bit differently. If I want to de-energize the secondary and keep this in and out, the primary still energized, I can pull the fuse. It's kind of messy. The transformer is full of oil, and you see this plate right here that actually deflects the oil. This one comes with a nice option here. It's got an open and closed switch. So at this point in time, this switch is open. What it does is it disconnects the primary coil from the secondary coil of the transformer so I can de-energize the secondary to work on it. If I need to pull in a new secondary line and I want to de-energize the secondary only, all I have to do is put the switch to open, which it is right now. When I'm ready to re-energize it, I put my shotgun stick at the end, twist it, and go to closed. Then I've re-energized my secondary. So two options here. Pull the fuse. We'll de-energize the secondary. Primary stays hot. This one with this little extra Cadillac action going on here. This nice little piece. Open the switch. De-energizes the secondary. Primary still stays hot. Close the switch. Uh, re-energizes the secondary. And, you know, you don't really see this option too often in too many transformers right here. 
you're either going to have one or the other. The bayonet or the switch. This one has the bayonet, bayonet and the switch. And it's a little bit more expensive, but very, very convenient if you want to de-energize the secondary in a very nice, clean operation. Mr. Vermelin, anything else? Good. Okay. All right. Secondary enclosure uh, or secondary injection. And uh, Professor Vermelin said in his verbiage out there, actually a secondary pedestal. Secondary pedestal does exactly what the primary enclosure uh, three phase and single phase does, except it does it for secondary. It's only secondary voltages you can go into here. So we're going to have a transformer that we just left come out of it with secondary, come into the enclosure, and I'll show you the connector that we use in just a minute. So I'm going to use my mouse here. We're going to go in this side. Come up in here, make a connection, then I'm able to go to house, to house, to house with the service. Remember how that goes? Secondary from a piece of equipment to another piece of equipment, then service out, out, and out. The connector that we use, make sure I got you the right image here, ah, bingo, is what they call a watertight connector. Uh, they, they come in multiple sizes. This is one feed in and three taps out. They come up to a size of 10, I believe. I misquoted last time. I thought it was 8, but they do have one that's, that goes to a size 10. So I can have one wire in and 10 wires out. We follow the same rules here. One wire on the left-hand side goes in. That's my feed in from secondary. Then one wire one wire and one wire goes out. Now I'll give you a little explanation here. If I have duplex coming into the secondary enclosure, I'm going to need two watertight connectors. One watertight connector for the neutral and one watertight connector for the hot wire. That's both feed in. So neutral in one watertight connector and another watertight connector for the hot leg then I'm able to tap out of those for whatever I need to do. Triplex, I'm going to have to have, you guessed it, three water tight connectors, one for the neutral and one for each hot leg. And quadruplex, four water tight connectors. These are all enclosed. Let's see inside the secondary enclosure here. So they come up your conduit's probably going to come up to right about here in the ground. That's the berry level. You see that line right there? Your conduit's going to come up about hat high. Wires are going to stick out, and your watertight connectors are just going to be standing up in the air from the uh, rigidity, rigidity of the wire. And one, two, three. So just to wrap this up, triplex comes in, goes to one watertight connector, then however different taps I need, one to this house, one to this house, one to this house. It, all the neutrals come out of one watertight connector. One hot leg to another watertight connector. That's on the left-hand side of it. One tap out of the house, one tap out of the house, one tap out of the house. And then I need 240. The last piece of wire comes in, goes into a watertight connector. One tap out, one tap out, one tap out. It's like a, this is a junction box. And... This is the junction connection. Okay. Mr. Vermelin, anything you'd like to add? All righty. Last but not least, you guessed it, the electromechanical meter. Uh, you guys have done this multiple times before, so you know what the explanation of a meter is and what a meter does on a house. And that pretty much wraps it up. So uh, if you get to this video first online, make sure that you go into D2L and check what it's used for. There's uh, more instructions on what you're supposed to do and be able to these pictures. I just, for one, did not want to do a PowerPoint presentation out there in the world like we've shown before and show you, uh, you know, a previous pre presentation. I want to give you a little bit better explanation of each component that's in this to be able to use in your presentations. Uh, Professor V, anything else you would like to add? I'm going to wrap this up.
Uh, the due date is Monday at 9 p.m. So, Professor Vermland, uh, we're going to create another video here just for instructional purposes. Uh, this is for April the 2nd to begin. It will be due at 9 p.m. on Monday. And I don't even know what that day is. Hold on. I'm still presenting. I'll get my calendar up here. It will be due. Hey, it's due on my birthday, April the 6th. So it will be due uh, April the 6th by 9 p.m. Professor Vermlin is also creating the uh, work for uh, Monday that will be online. And that pretty much wraps it up. If you've got any questions, uh, give us a ring on Zoom or send us something on Remind. And we will catch you gentlemen later. Thank you very much, guys.